Hi, Clutter Fairy fans. This is the Clutter Fairy Weekly for September 17th, 2024. I'm your co-host, Ed Gumnick, and I'm speaking with Gail Goddard, certified professional organizer and owner of the Clutter Fairy in Houston, Texas. Hi, everybody. The Clutter Fairy Weekly is the webcast and podcast that digs deep into the clutter that piles up between you and the life you want to be living. We explore the habits and the behaviors that lead to clutter, and we suggest strategies to slow the accumulation, reduce the collection, and comfortably manage the stuff we decide to keep. If you're new to our Zoom, Zoom meeting, we want to let you know that you can share your comments and questions via the chat feature, and I'll try to make sure Gail addresses them before we move on to another topic. You can also use the raise hand feature if you'll, you'd like to ask a question or make a comment yourself via audio or video. And we are also streaming the webcast live on Facebook, so you can share questions and comments there, and I'll relay them to Gail. We're going to start by recapping last week's weekly tittle, which was called Push Back on Procrastination. The assignment was to take aim at a project or task on which you've been procrastinating. Let's hear from our participants in Zoom and on Facebook. Who tackled a stale or overdue task or project this week? Please let us know in the comments. YouTube viewer Beth shared this comment in response to our procrastination tittle. Sometimes in dealing with procrastination, I have to dig deep and find the one shred of adult left in me, treat, my, treat myself like a child, and bribe myself. <laughs> I thought that was so hilarious. Beth's best approach satisfies, satisfies the be gentle with yourself technique that we suggested as part of last week's tittle. When you're facing procrastination, you have a choice between beating yourself up and which is likely only going to reinforce your resistance to the task you're avoiding, or you can treat yourself with kindness and patience. Self-compassion, positive self-talk, and yes, the occasional bribe can help you clear away the roadblocks and focus on the benefit or the objective of the thing you're procrastinating about. And I have to say that I heard a story a long time ago when I was an accountant and I was studying for the CPA exam and I was talking to someone else who had also studied for it. And she said the only way that she could consistently sit down for so many hours a day and um, study for the exam, do the practice tests, all those things that you had to do to get ready, was that she allowed herself to eat potato chips while she was working. And that was her bribe, that she was not, you know, yes, they weren't on her diet. Yes, she wasn't supposed to be eating them. But she was like, okay, this is once in my lifetime. I'm going <laughs> to pass this exam. Therefore, I'm allowed to eat potato chips while I study. And that was her bribe that allowed her to keep going. And I think there's something to be said for, you know, sometimes you need a bribe. And so <laughs> whatever works to help you get past, because as many people have rightfully pointed out, once you get started, a lot of it is just getting the train rolling down the track. And once you get started, you can hang in and stay there and work on it. Um, but you have to get yourself going first and get getting past that stall is the is the ever important first step that you need to take in order to get rolling. So, you know, get your last shred of adult and, and give your kid a cry and get yourself going. <laughs> And thank you, Beth. I appreciate that. Uh. Um, so, uh, just in case uh, anyone is, well, if if our YouTube viewers are curious about the background, let's talk about that for a second, because we had a question about it in the chat. Okay. This, this is the galley of a commercial airliner. I don't know what type. We've been joking that this is Gail's private jet that she uses <laughs> to fly around the world to, to, to deorganize, I mean, de, de, whoops, declutterize and organize <laughs> her, her fans everywhere. Right. And, you know, it has the pink interior, pink clutter fairy color as well. If you look over to the side there, yes. <laughs> he clutter fairy eyes the interior of the plane to go with our theme colors, which I thought was awesome. Um, You know, Clutter Force One is ready to come to you anytime. That's right. <laughs> and the purpose of that galley is to show, um, you know, they take an incredibly tight space. They have limited capacity. They have to carry a high volume for the number of people. You know, like that's, you know, where snacks and supplies are to supply all the people sitting in the plane. And so uh, those containers are designed to fit in the galley, not um, be locked in so they don't 
fly out at the slightest movement of the plane. Like they can't be sliding off the counter when the plane takes off or lands, right? And there's clear space with nothing on top. So they have all those containers and they don't have anything blocking their ability to pull them in and out. And um, they all have the, you can see little labels right there. There's little labels on them to identify what they are. And so um, they've created this space to function for the, you know, the galley service that they're supposed to provide on the plane. And uh, it's a perfect example of who, uh, what else would you do with this weird curved shape that is the shape of the plane? That's the parameter that they had to work with and to make it work. And so they designed, given that the walls are, are it's not like clearly this fisheye lens is making that an exaggerated curve, but there's still a curve. The plane is not, uh, it's not a square plane. It's a right. curved plane. And so it's they have to tube. work with those parameters. <laughs> exactly. It's a big tube. And so they, they did their designing to fit the parameters that they had and to make that small space work. And, and they, you know, they built things from the ceiling to the floor there's, you know, a little counter in the middle, but basically they took all the available state, space that they had and went vertical out to the edges of the space that was there. And so it's a good example of adapting a small space to function well. We know it works. We all get our drinks and snacks. Right. <laughs> right. When we go on the plane, everybody gets a drink and a snack. Although if you're toward the back, sometimes if you're towards the back of the plane, you get your drink and then about 30 seconds later, they come and take it away from you because it's time to land. <laughs> right, exactly. Uh, we have some <laughs> more tittle, tittle reports. Connie says, I cross-checked and updated my address book. Oh, that's a good one. Good work, Connie, because that's an easy one to ignore. It's a very easy thing to procrastinate on when all you have to do is shut the cover and stick it back on the shelf, right? Right. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, you probably found a lot of outdated things out there too. So it's a good thing to do. Exactly. Um, Excellent Jane, one. <laughs> Jane reports, now that the construction work is wrapping up here, I need to do some touch-up painting and hang the decor I decide to keep. I tried to get someone to help. Since that hasn't worked out, I've ordered touch-up painting tools and plan to go through all the decor and decide what will be hung. The rest will be donated before the end of this month. Time to wrap this up. Go team, go. You're so close. You're just right at the tail end. Make yourself happy. Make it look beautiful to yourself. And, you know, make some decisions like those walls aren't moving. That stuff isn't going anywhere. The, the spaces that you have is not changing. So once you decide what wall, what counter, what, you know, little corner of the next to the door will accept artwork, accept decor, then you, you know you're kind of done, right? Like that the your list of choices isn't getting longer. And so uh, set stuff up how you like it and then dust the, dust the rest off and send it on its way so you don't have to keep it. You don't have to store it for the magical um, point where someday there's going to be a space to put this because there isn't. Unless you decide <laughs> to start tearing out a wall or throwing up, you know, some shelves somewhere that, uh, you know, hasn't happened so far. Uh, I would say that you can be done at that point. Wouldn't that be, I'm sure you're going to be so relieved when it's complete. It's been a long journey, but I'm sure you're going to be super pleased when it's all done. We're here for you. Come and tell us how it's going again. Catherine reports a um, uh, tittle. This is a tittle report by proxy. She says, not mine, oh. <laughs> but my brother arrived and got rid of stump eyesores. 16 stumps, ground and holes filled in. Oh my wow, goodness. Wow, looks great. Well, and that's a that's the kind that's of thing. That's a big project. That is a big project. Yeah. And it's that last little bit of of the the bigger and expensive project of you know removing unneeded or trees, yeah. damaged or old trees. Yeah. So good for her, good for Catherine's brother for getting. It that must one have done. taken him hours though. Sixteen stumps is not a small amount. That sounds like work. Wow! No kidding. He must have been so. <laughs> He must have been wiped out when it was done. I hope you made him something good to eat. <laughs> right. <laughs> and finally, Paula reports, I finally took my bags to the thrift store after they sat around for too many months. Excellent. We are all, everybody cheer for that. Yay. That is excellent because that is everybody's hang up. Everybody's Achilles heel. You make the piles that are going to go on the errand. You make the pile of things that you're going to take to the thrift store. You're going to take the donation. And then you don't ever actually run that errand or do that chore. And then the stuff just stays there. So 
every time you complete one of those errands, you need to do a little happy dance. Happy, happy, happy. Because yay. Good for you. I'm so proud. Uh, my equivalent was I drove around with the uh, chemicals that needed to go to the environmental service center from the day of the move. So all that stuff went into my car in August, the 24th of August. And it rode around in my car for like two weeks because I kept going to the place. I made three trips that finally dropped it off oh. and I kept going and they weren't open. Ugh. And it's like, Oh, I thought I had the dates correct. I thought I knew what I was doing and clearly I didn't. And so I missed my, tw I missed twice. And then I went in and I had left my wallet at home and I didn't have my driver's license and they wouldn't let me oh my gosh. drop it off without my driver's license to verify that I was a resident of the city. And so I had to go home, get the driver's license, go back. And I'm like, I'm coming back before you guys close. I'm not, this is stuff is getting out of my car today. And then they got to the, you know, they opened the hatch up and looked back there. And I started hearing this, ooh, she may have reached the 100 pound limit. I don't know. It's like, if they leave stuff in my car, I'm just going to be so aggravated. <laughs> but it all went. Yay. <laughs> but it took me three trips. So. And three, actually four. By the time I went to my driver's license, I came back. And but that's the kind of thing. It's like it's an errand and it's annoying. And sometimes you can't always make it happen. And so once you finally do, happy, happy, happy. I did a little happy dance when I drove away from the environmental service center for sure. So you need to give yourself that little reward of you did the job, you did the task, you ran the errand and got it done. Good for you. Okay, I I was wrong. One more tittle report because this one really illustrates one of our suggestions very okay. effectively and the, the suggestion of removing distractions. Naomi says, I made four phone calls I have been avoiding. What Ooh. finally worked was that the office became so crowded and hectic that I needed to go sit in my car to make the calls. And in my car, there was nothing else to do. Oh, fair point, right? So, like you can't be distracted by your desk if you're not actually at it. Yeah. I, I, that's a really, that's a, that's a potent lesson because your desk all is always rich with distractions unless mm -hmm, you've you know mm -hmm. managed to like lock all your drawers and give the keys to someone else to control <laughs> there's there's always stuff there on your desk or in your desk to distract you and right you know whatever whatever it takes Naomi went to her car and had no choice but to get those darn phone calls made and you know also being in the office where you can like if you're in a cubicle land or if you're in an office with the door open and you can hear other people in the office, um, the fact that you're in an office doesn't always make it is not always conducive to getting work done in terms of distractions. If you can hear all your colleagues also on the phone, having meetings, talking to each other, blah, 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 whatever they're doing. And so the idea of going to the car to make phone calls that required your full attention in order to talk yourself into making them like, nothing else going on in there and so at least you had the privacy of making the phone call without another without competing noise yeah without other people listening to your conversation and you know it makes it a little bit more private and focused that you went and did it in the car i like it i like it a lot um i would only add that if you use this as a tool that you do it somewhere where you feel safe so that you're right. not sitting in the parking lot of the Walmart or something at nine o'clock at night, making phone calls in the dark. <laughs> I really want you to feel safe while you're in the car. But other than that, I, I think it's a great, it was a great idea and good for you to get it done. And did you did four of them at once. And lots of times um, there's something about making phone calls that people don't want to do them. They don't want to get in that conversation. They don't want to have to do all of the small talk that goes along with making the phone call. They don't want to get there. And so doing four is a huge number. <laughs> Most people struggle to do the one and then walk away. So if you yeah. manage to get four done, you get extra gold stars today. Star, 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 because you did four at once. Good job. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Lots of great stuff in the chat today, but we have to move on. Okay. In our second to last survey, two weeks ago, we asked our audience, what is your unique or unusual decluttering or organizing challenge? And we promised last week to discuss favorite responses in upcoming episodes this was a, as i said before this was a trick question because it turns out that even seemingly unusual organizing issues are the result of universal issues and concerns so we we think these things will um probably apply to a lot of our audience right. so this week barbara responded 
I inherited lots of tools after my father passed. Right now, they are cluttering my basement. I keep them because my son-in-law is very handy with tools. I don't give them to him because I'm not sure the marriage will last. <laughs> Nothing like being all right out there and up front, Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> we hear you. Out of respect for your father, who put the time and the money into collecting the tools, you want to make sure not only that the tools are going to go to someone who's going to use them and enjoy them, but if possible, that they remain in the family. And you're not sure whether your son-in-law is a keeper. It can be hard to reconcile those competing values. But ask yourself, is it better that dad's tools keep cluttering my basement until I find the perfect home for them? Or that they go to someone who's ready to use them right now, even at the risk that they'll pass out of your control someday? Here's another way to think about it. Do you want the tools to deteriorate in your basement for the rest of your life? At which point you'll no longer have any control over them at all. Or do you want to clear them away and let someone put them to use right now? And if your son-in-law is truly handy with tools, doesn't he qualify as a worthy recipient to have them and use them? Even if he leaves the family in the future, he'll still be a handy guy making good uses of all those tools that you gave him from your dad. In my opinion, the good deed of giving the tools away to an active tool user is really what you're aiming for here. And so what if he doesn't stay married into the family? You're really helping those tools get used no matter what else happens because he's a tool guy. He's a handy guy. And so they're going to go on for their, to be used in their, uh, get some more life out of the tools because he's going to be using them. And, you know, if you're like me, I could have all kinds of tools. They would never get used at my house because I don't know nothing about no tools. But if he's somebody who actually knows how to use them and can make good use of them, like your dad did, he's just a baked in good recipient. Yeah. And it, and it honors the, it honors your father's work and commitment to the, to the, that stuff. To having that collection, you know, to, that he used it for. To let it go to someone who's going to make good use of it mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. if possible. And I get it. Like, you know, it feels good because he's in the family right now. What if he's not in the family? <laughs> and, you know, okay, yeah, so you might, you would want it to go to somebody in the family first. But if he's the obvious choice in the family and there isn't somebody else who would use them in the same way, it doesn't do any good to keep it in the family. If, you're, if your son-in-law wasn't an option, you would have the same problem. There's There was no one else in your family that's handy and wants those tools. And you still have to get rid of them somehow and get them. And you still want them to go to somebody that's going to use them. And so if he was the stranger who answered the ad, when you put in a note and said, Hey, all these tools are available, you would happily give them to him because he's a handy guy and, and it's, it would be okay. And so just think about it this way. Even if he's not a keeper, he's still the handy guy that, you know, that's going to use those tools. The okay. end. <laughs> Let's move on to our main topic. Okay. Airplanes, ships, trains, hotel rooms, and other specialized spaces are designed to get the most efficient use out of limited space. Can we apply design elements of these tiny areas as we organize our own small spaces? Today, we're going to offer tips and techniques for getting the most and best use out of your small spaces. So we're going to start today with the results of our survey. We asked our audience to select from several options to describe your living situation. And here's what we got. 34% of our audience responded to, I live in a small house where limited space for living and storage tends to cause issues throughout. So that's, you know, a third of our audience. 25% checked, I live in a spacious home with plenty of room for living and storage. So we have the small space and they have issues storage issues everywhere we have 25 percent with big house and plenty of plenty of storage and living space everywhere so two ends of the spectrum but we presume those <clears throat> the latter 25 percent are people who are here because they are not yet making the best use of all that good space they have available right or it may be that they fill that space up completely and they they and made good use of their spacious home. <laughs> made, yes. They've used right? more space than they actually have in their spacious home. Right. And then 14% said, I live in a spacious home with a few areas in which space for living or storage is limited and causes issues. And those kinds of things pop up because of 
you know, architect, design, design builder, yeah. execution, where they just do a poor job of creating the storage space or the living space and sometimes cause some problems. And then another a quarter of a respondents checked other and then described the particular conditions or circumstances that complicate their ability to manage the clutter. And M is an example. She wrote, previously, I lived on 18 acres without buildings. Now I live in an apartment of about 900 square feet. And the first thought that I had was, oh my God, <laughs> that is a really, oh wow. A lot of our audience members have experienced downsizing, although not many have had to make such an extreme change as M from 18 acres to 900 square feet. That's a lot. It's really, really drastic. And so the thing about downsizing is when you go from a big space or spacious with lots of living area and lots of storage area, as we described, if you go from that space to 900 square feet, it's such a drastic change, but you don't usually make that same level of reduction in contents because we resist letting go of the contents. And so if you have to get rid of 75% of your stuff in order to have an equivalent amount of things in the new space, the new small space that you used to have in the old space, a lot of times you don't quite make it to 75%. And it's, it, and it's totally because you can't imagine not having some of those things because you've had them for so long. But the definition of downsizing is you are surrendering space, therefore you are surrendering stuff at an equal quantity at an equal ratio and you will if you don't do that thoroughly and well you will move from a space that you are comfortable in to a much smaller space and have too much stuff in it and you'll be crowded out so it it, it does have the effect of um, putting you in a situation that you end up with more you feeling more crowded and trapped than you were when you downsize because you have a harder time letting go of stuff carrie shared I live in a small home with just the right amount of space. However, my bathroom is tiny, so it's good that I live alone, <laughs> which I thought, of course it's good when you, everyone needs their own bathroom. Um, it sounds as if Carrie either chose a space that's a great fit for her stuff, or she's managed to adjust her stuff to fit perfectly in her space. Either way, that's a great outcome. Once you go down to a small space, adjusting your stuff to the capacity of the space becomes the top priority. You have to limit yourself to what can actually fit in the space all on, in all the areas of your house. And so it becomes make the furniture the correct size for the house, make the storage, make the contents fit the storage that you have. Um, there's always when you downsize to a smaller space, one of the rooms that gets shrunk is the kitchen and the storage in the kitchen. And so if you have had, you know, 25 cabinets to hold all the stuff that you want about your kitchen and you only get rid of a third of it. And then you move into this much smaller kitchen with much even smaller cabinets and less number of cabinets. Then you find that you don't even have room to put your regular stuff, much less the things that you don't use very often. And so uh, that's an area where getting rid of stuff becomes super, super important. We always have too much stuff in the kitchen. I'm just going to say that in general, that and in the bathroom and the linen closet. Next, we asked our audience to describe rooms or areas of our home in which the lack of available space makes living, storage, decluttering, and organizing challenging. And here's some typical responses. Hila, Hila? Hila, I think. Hila wrote, in my home, there isn't a balcony, so I have no place for plants. And definitely, if you downsize from, I used to have a yard I used to have an outdoor space that I could put plants in and then you move into an apartment building or you don't have a balcony or whatever the shift is where you suddenly don't have outdoor space, then um, you have to convert to indoor plants. And that is a major gardening change, right? Like it's a shift over in philosophy and the things that grow inside are completely different and the whole doing everything in pots is different <laughs> So there's, there's a whole bunch of, not that I'm an expert gardener, but there's a whole bunch of changes that you have to do to grow plants indoors as opposed to outdoors. And so um, I can see that one would be one that would, one of the ways you would adjust, right? And then you can't have, if you have, to have outdoor spaces, you can have outdoor tools and supplies that you work on the yard and that doesn't translate into the inside of the house. So having a bunch of 
chemicals, food, tools, et cetera, pots, pot, potting soil in a small apartment isn't really a th good thing either. So you really have to decide what kinds of plants you're going to have and how much um, backstock supplies you're going to keep and, uh, and change the whole way that you garden in order to convert it to an indoor thing. Leslie wrote, she has a new build house without a linen closet. See, that's some builder architect stupidity right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Why would you have a new house with no linen closet? That's dumb. <clears throat> See, that's why they should make organizers walk around the house and ask questions. <laughs> Two bathrooms <Right. sighs> have open shelves for all of the things. So the idea being that in the bathroom, there's open shelving and you're supposed to put your towels and your toilet paper and your medicine chest stuff and your linens and all that stuff is supposed to be up on these open shelves. I have some pull-out plastic bins for miscellaneous items and I'm putting linens in my walk-in closet. It's hard to make it look beautiful like a show home. Yeah, it's true because they never put all the actual things you need to live in your house in a showroom. They don't want you to see that part. <laughs> so... <laughs> The way to cope with open shelving really is to make the items that will be out be uniform and beautiful. Um, and, and so I'm imagining in a kitchen where they have open shelving for uh, the for the dishes, then you buy a beautiful matching set of dishes. It's all wide. It's all the color. It's all whatever print you want to be able to see. And it's out so that you can see it so that the dishes themselves become a decor item up on the shelves. But that doesn't always work, right? And so it, you can also add in to these open shelves uniform, nice-looking storage containers that creates a clean, clean look so that um, the other stuff that has to be on the shelves is contained in something that when you look at the shelf, you see a row of matching um, storage containers and you can't really see into them. And that creates a clean look for you to see on the open shelf. And then you take something down and pull stuff out of the, out of that container in order to use it in the kitchen. And, and this is where if you're going to have open shelves and you're going to keep them and you're not going to have a builder come in and like hang cabinets or something, if you're just going to adapt to the open shelves, then it's worth to spend the money, um, the extra money on a nicer container that you can buy multiples of, and they all match. And, you know, whatever materials I made out of, they're going to look nicer. And then that gives you that uniform look that you're looking for. And it's not too busy and it's not, it doesn't look chaotic on the open shelves. It's worth it to spend the money on containers there. If you're putting containers in a closet, in a cabinet, whatever, it can be plastic pull out drawers and nobody's really looking at it. And so it's, it's, it's easy to go less expensive that way. But when it's all going to be out, um, you want to shift gears to. It's made out of fabric. It's made out of bamboo. It's made out of metal. It's, you know, it's covered with something. It's painted, whatever. It's all uniform. And um, and you're going to spend a little bit more money for those um, containers that are nice as a set, right? Right. Or invest time in making them beautiful mm -hmm. and uniform mm -hmm. by your own handiwork. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Naomi says she hates uniformity. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and and the truth is, the thing about open shelves is put things out on the shelf and it looks all like there's lots of busyness happening. Some people find that busyness very distracting and very, um, they don't like the look of it. It looks too busy and then it just, it bothers them. So it depends on what you see when you look on the shelf with all the stuff on it. If it's, if, if you need it to be uniform for it to be soothing and not irritating, great. And if you can look at those open shelves with all the stuff on them and it doesn't bother you, um, that you find that functional and pretty to look at and not a, bo not a bother, then awesome. Certainly adapt it for your own taste. I've just had a lot of people tell me this is why people that aren't organized but find clutter distracting shove everything into drawers and make a big mess in the cabinets and the drawers because they're just trying to hide it from themselves because the visual landscape needs to be clear for them to feel calm all right and so um you know their their problem is all behind a cabinet door inside a drawer <laughs> the <laughs> chaos is all behind something so you can't really see it right away heather writes my 1970s kitchen isn't large enough to hold everything Small appliances appliances and stockpots are stored in the hall closet. I'll bet the 1970s kitchen never envisioned holding as much as we store in kitchens nowadays. 
if you're using the hall closet, stuff is likely stacked on top of each other and it's hard to get something out of there. I check on what's stored there and make sure that you actually have stored things that you'll use. It is likely that it's time to reevaluate the contents in the linen closet and make sure it all needs to be there and whatever, whatever hall closet you're storing stock pots in, just go pull everything out. Make sure it all needs to be there. Make sure the hall closet is the place that makes sense for it to be stored. Make sure that you don't have any, you know, like, do you really need 12 stock pots? Probably not. You can probably <laughs> send the herd, you know, so, um, go through that collection and make sure that it all needs to be there. And um, Gail, you already confessed that you who never cook at all had two crock pots. I right? did. When it was I time did. to had two of them. clear your kitchen. For and moving. what the hell, right? Yeah. Right. And one of them was in, um, <laughs> the, the, I had a big pantry that had big, uh, deep drawers. I mean, uh, big shelves. And I had shoved one of them, into the back of that cabinet and the bottom and it never came out. And the other one was over with the pots and pans in the kitchen. And so they clearly had arrived at two different times, but yeah, one of them went out when it was time to start packing. That is for sure. <laughs> it was time for it to go. Okay. Then Noreen says that her primary closet is a walk-in, but it's very narrow and it's hard to organize. And I think this is a perfect time for you to consult with a closet expert. Somebody that does closet installs uh, to see what's possible in there. In the meantime, as a rule of thumb, put the stuff you don't need often or that you're storing long-term with no intent of getting it back out again into the, if you think that the, here's the walk-in clo walk closet, but it's really narrow. Does that mean that the door's in the middle and you go to the left and the right of the closet? Or is it a long, narrow um, train car and you walk down the center of it? Um, either way, you want to think of the open door and that door frame as the stuff, as your target area for your most frequently used things. So even if you're walking from the front of the train car to the back, or you're standing at the open door and the closet goes left and right, the stuff that you can reach standing in the door frame, that's your prime real estate. And that's the stuff that should be what you use all the time, what you get into all the time. And the farther back in the train car or the left or the right of the train car that you go, um, the less likely it is that you need to get it, to so use the, it, to have so the it. Backup crock pot goes all the way in the back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and I'm thinking of, you know, we put things in closets like that. It's like, oh, here's my box of photographs. I'm never going to take it out. Here's my, you know, here's all of my journals and I add a new journal to it once a year, once every two years or something, a completed journal. That's the kind, here's my tax returns. That's the kind of stuff that you put way into the back, the farthest um, corners below and above um, your cabinet space or your um, clothing rods to make sure that it's not underfoot when you are standing in the easiest accessible area. Um, that what stays in that easy reach, um, you know, first, two, if, you, if it's a train car, the first two or three feet on either side of the train car, um, that that's all the clothes that you wear all the time. And the farther back you go or the farther out you go from the door frame, um, the less frequently you're going to need that stuff. And then it, when you get to the back, back end, that's the stuff that you're never taking out. <laughs> and so uh, that or hardly ever Christmas decorations once a year, that kind of stuff. Those are the things that take up that real estate that's far and away. But um, it is something that you have to understand that when houses are built, they do not consult a closet expert. The architect draws a closet. They go, yeah, put a closet here. And the builder throws a couple rods up. <laughs> and he, you know, that, that the thought that goes into the closet is not super extensive. That's not their, their primary goal is to make a room that is going to be a closet and get some rods up. And that's basically <clears throat> the effort that they put into it. And so uh, you have to know that whatever decisions were made were probably not well thought out and uh, not a lot of time or money was put into them. And so if you have a big issue there, um, it's a perfect place to A, consider spending money and B, consider consulting an expert. There's lots of closet system companies and you can have somebody come out and look at the space and go, yeah, here's what we would do in here. 
we would tear that out and tear this out and install something here and something there. And, you know, they will look at your unique parameters and come up with, clearly it, it's going to be their system, but it's going to come up with, uh, they're going to apply all their expertise to getting the most um, efficient design in the space that you have. And, you know, letting a couple of different companies look at your space and think about it and, and come up with great ideas about how to design that closet with some thought of actually using it and having it be functional, you know, that's worth, it's worth the effort. It's worth the money to improve a closet that's difficult for you all the time. Will um, closet designers uh, usually give you like a, a, you know, free estimate or a cons mm. consultation? Yeah. Yeah. Then, I mean, cause they're trying to sell their, their stuff. Right. But so then you'll have send to somebody out. You'll hire, have to hire them to get a detailed plan. Right. Probably, but they, yeah. but they'll still, <laughs> give you some ideas and show you some of the the drawers and shelving and products that they can apply in the closet to make the closet function better. And it, just having those thoughts about we could do it this way and make an improvement here, at the very least, it'll probably give you some ideas. And it, it'll also give you some, okay, I think, you know, if I put $2,000 into this closet, it's going to work so much better for me and I should, you know, save up my money and, and, you know, let them do it. Uh, Jane says, I've put Alpha in my closets over time. Even if Alpha isn't in your budget, getting a free design from them could help you consider how to maximize the space. Mm. If interested in Alpha, definitely wait for a sale. Are they, uh, so that's Alpha, E-L-F-A. Um, uh, somebody responding to our last survey or maybe the one before asked us to repeat that because uh, they heard us mention it and couldn't find it later. Yeah. Yeah. Alpha um, is the wire closet system that container store sells. And it, it's exclusive to the container container store, right? Yeah. It's yeah. There, there's other brand. wire systems. Yes. But right. The Alpha is their product and they're all of their matching systems and drawers and pulleys and containers and everything that goes with it. So. And, and Ikea has, some similar mm. similar s solutions and also planning uh they they also have like planning software that a consultant in the store can help you help yeah, you yeah. Use, right yeah 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 and and the closet factory uh california closet like if you just do closets google closet systems you can get all these companies that go out there that do you know from regular to really high-end closet r makeovers and and all of them will come out and look at your closet and suggest what they could do to improve it. And, and that's what you want to see. You want to see somebody that understands the needs, understands the products that are going to go in, understands how they can make a, a weird shaped closet into something that would actually be useful, would be uh, worth the effort. <laughs> Especially if you feel like your closet is really not functioning well, then, you know, talk to some experts and see what they can do for you because you go in that closet every day and it annoys you every day that you live in that house. And if you intend to be in that house for a while, like if you're moving out next month, yeah, don't worry about it. Right. But if, but if you're going to be there for a decade, then do you really want to be annoyed every day for a decade? No, <laughs> you don't. So you don't want to keep that. So spending the money as whatever you can to improve that situation for yourself is worth it, I think. Okay, let's go on. All right. Frankie's um, sounding off in the room. You can't hear him, right? <laughs> he is howling no. in the, uh, some other part of the house. He's thinking of y'all. <laughs> So if you're living in a small space that's really full of decluttering and organizing challenges, or you live in a large space that was designed and built with some storage and living space limitations, we want to really help you. So let's start with some basic small space organizing principles. The first point I need to make is one I'm sure you know I'm going to make. <laughs> Your smaller space is not getting any bigger. Uh, and we're going to talk about ways to optimize space so you can make use of all that's available to you. But we can't help you wedge in huge amounts of excess stuff into every available pocket of your home and still promise you that it will be livable. Smaller real estate means you have to be really intentional about everything that lives with you. You don't have room to say, I'll just stuff this in the closet to deal with it later. Deal with it later requires more extra square feet than you get in small spaces. So no junk room, no junk drawer, no stashes of unknown items in a house or an apartment that's small. 
You need to spend your time making sure that everything you want to keep has a place, everything that you use has a place, and the amount of keeping this just because is at a bare minimum, the smallest amount possible. And then there's an associated piece of advice here. There's no, you can't have large collections of anything. <laughs> if you're living in a really small space, your collections need to be small, small also. In a small space, you need to focus on quality over quantity. Your collections need to be curated to fit your space. And that means keeping a much tighter grip on your shopping impulse. You don't want to stock up with lots of overflow on everything. Shop more often to replace items as you run out instead of building up that big inventory. So, you know, if you like having a pantry with, you know, six weeks worth of food depth in it, you probably need to be living in a bigger place <laughs> because you're going to have to give up too much of your living space to have that. And my new pantry is a perfect example of this idea. You can walk in, air quotes, you can walk in-ish, but really what's happening is that I'm stepping into a, a, a central door and the pantry runs to the left and to the right from that door and the builder threw up two shelves. In a space, you know, a pantry that's floor to ceiling, right? Like it's a, it's a room-ish, um, but he put two shelves on it. So it's really, it's right now, there's really not a lot of shelf space to hold stuff. So it's certainly something I need to make sure that my pantry fits on those two shelves right now. And, and then later, that's one of those uh, rooms that I'm going to go in and redo. I'm going to rebuild that pantry so that there's more than just two shelves in there and stupid builders, right? Like, they threw in a couple of shelves and said, yeah, that'll work. Slam, slam. And they, and they walked away and it's like, right. Nobody, yeah, yeah, no. nobody eats at home anyway. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's definitely in the meantime, I'm going to have to adapt with, um, you know, containers that have some vertical height on the shelves, some, some shelving, um, you know, like wire shelving and stuff that create an artificial extra layer so I can put things below and above, you know, stacked one, on, one over the other with a little wire shelf in between that kind of stuff. Right. So I, you know, what can you do? <laughs> we all have to, um, we all have to adapt and, and my pantry, they, you know, they, they spent money on making a, a frosted design cause it's got a glass in the door and they made it have a frosted design and have, you know, word pantry on there pantry. So it looks pretty, but it is, totally not functional as a pantry it's completely useless as a pantry so i'm going to be rebuilding that let me just say top of the list i think you know for the people who live in spacious homes but have some problem areas mm. it's important to recognize that these two these two principles still apply your small space isn't going to get any bigger unless you're willing to you know take out walls and hire yeah. hire architects and builders and you're you can't have if if your linen closet is tiny you can't stock all the colors of towels under the sun or you know six sets of backup sheets for every bed right you, yeah yeah you, you 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 have to accept the limitations of of the space if you don't have the resources to radically change them right 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 and <clears throat> And if you accept that that, you know, linen closet is too small and you can't have all the pieces, if you still want to keep stuff, then you have to figure out storage within those bedrooms, for instance, where you want to keep extra sets of sheets. You have to be able to store them in the rooms where the bed are if they won't fit in the pantry. I mean, in the linen closet. So right. it does create a challenge for you either make it fit the storage they provide you or you have to create open storage in rooms that don't have it. Otherwise you have to add a storage container. You have to put something under the bed. You have to use a drawer in a dresser. You have to create storage to accommodate your extra. And so in a house that's already um, small or even it big and the storage is being used, finding another place to stash more linens when your linen closet is small you know, it's not going to be super easy and you're going to be surrendering space that you might need for something else in that room actually. So that's a perfect example of you had a large linen closet collection of stuff. And when you moved, you didn't get an equivalent storage space for all the linens in the new place. 
And so making those linens shrink to fit comfortably, you know, you want it to be easy to put the stuff away. And if it's not easy to put things away, if you're having to jam them in, then you haven't given up enough yet. And it's time to let some more go. And you don't need 47 changes of sheets for every bed. Um, nobody's changing the sheets that fast <laughs> and not keeping up with the laundry. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah. So can only put one set on the bed at a time. Don't need that many changes. And now's the time to thin it out. So on that note, let's uh, remembering all that advice as a backdrop. And we can talk a little bit about small space organizing ideas. Perennial favorite. You want to think vertically. You can't make it bigger, but you can use some vertical storage solutions. Like um, what about a bunk bed? What about high shelves? What about those little decor shelves um, that people put like they put a little rail basically up on the wall and then they stand decor things up on the railing or they put books on them or they, you know, fill in the blank, right? You put all, you hang one in your bathroom and you put the hairspray and the hair conditioner and that kind of stuff up on it. The ones that you use all the time. Um, you can go low. So make use of space underneath the bed, underneath the dresser. Basically, any piece of furniture that has legs, you can put things sometimes underneath those pieces of furniture. And if you uh, use space that's in a public area, then consider you the container to be, you want it to be opaque, you want it to match your decor, you want it to be neutral so it fades into the background. But ultimately, people adapt to a reduction in space by creating storage underneath things that have legs. So, and sometimes like putting the bed on risers and the riser is, you know, six or seven or eight inches tall. And so it lifts the bed up off the floor. If you can still get in the bed after you make it eight inches taller or six inches taller, as long as you can still climb in the bed, it's good. Um, but that, that does sort of create um, a slightly larger void under the bed um, that you can use to store stuff. Again, not an endless storage capacity um, location, but it does provide you uh, some places to store some boxes if you're tight on space. You want to recap recapture some wasted space like the backs of doors, but especially the, the back side of the closet door, the bathroom door, any thin slot between the large piece of furniture and a wall, like the slot next to the refrigerator. You use the space above the toilet, so that's a wasted space unless you go in and add some shelves or a cabinet there. Um, just make sure you're not going to hit your head. <laughs> if you add something to the toilet, make sure it's not going to stick out and whack you in the head when you sit down. Um, you can add containers to windowsills. Um, you can use a curtain rod between cabinets. If you have two uh, cabinets and there's a gap in between them, you can have a curtain rod and things hanging off of it uh, if that's necessary. There's ways for you to recapture wasted space. And sometimes that's above sometimes it's below sometimes it's beside um there's always a little hidey holes that you can in incorporate into your storage necessities um, be really ruthless about what's accumulating about the clutter that's being added back it may mean that you have to do decluttering more frequently um, than you would have done in a larger space you have to process the mail every day instead of once a week you have to take the recycling out every other day instead of waiting for two whole weeks right before the recycling comes to go take it all out. You don't have a lot of small, you don't have a lot of space in a small apartment or house to have a bunch of delayed decisions and lack of systems in there. Um, because if you delay a bunch of decisions, you're going to fill up your small space much faster. And it's going to be surprisingly, oh my gosh, I'm drowning again. And it wasn't, it was a very short period of time, but it wasn't, it doesn't seem like you have that much, except that in a small space, it looks crowded and um, choked off a lot faster than it does in a bigger one. And don't forget the one in out, one out rule, right? If you're working with a small space, you don't need to buy eight because they're all different colors of the shirt that you love. <laughs> um, or if you buy eight, then you got to make eight go out because your closet's not getting bigger. And the smaller your space the faster you will feel like your closet is choked up. It's not going to be that big and it's not going to take very much to feel like your closet's overwhelmed. And here's one that everybody hates because they love Costco. You can't really buy in bulk if you live in a small space. If you are housing in your small space, you and a spouse and kids, then I see that maybe there's some exceptions that need to be made just because you're supplying your family. But anybody that 
is one or two people in a smaller space. Yeah, that whole going to Costco thing is not really a good thing because you don't have room for those bulk purchases. You don't have room for 24, um, you know, uh, paper towel rolls. You, you don't have room for 10 pounds of ground beef, right? It's not something that translates into smaller spaces. So you need to shift that shopping around. Um, this is a this is an Ed one in a, in a kitchen. You don't want a tool or product that is a unitasker. It can only do one thing. Instead, yeah. you want to keep those high quality tools that can serve more than one function. Make sure that what stays in the kitchen is not just sitting there waiting for the one time you make pancakes. <laughs> you know, it needs to be. Uh, all the things that need to stay in the kitchen need to have more than one purpose. So there's a possibility that you will use it more often, more frequently. It won't just sit there and take up space that you don't have just in case. Right. Yeah. If you were more of a cook, I would suggest replacing your crock pot with an instant pot. Yeah. Because crock pot is one of its functions, but it can, all, it's also a pressure cooker. It's a rice cooker. It, um, does there all that stuff. Are 14 different things you can do with your instant pot, <laughs> including incredible soup in about an hour. I could do ads for instant pot. I yeah. love it so much. <laughs> they would probably love for you to do ads for them, actually. Now that you say that, you can make your uh, living as being a, an instant pot spokesperson, <laughs> spokesmodel. <laughs> right? Use the space unconventionally. And I say this as someone who has, uh, for the last, 15 or 20 years had a space in wherever, whatever living room I was in was set up to be a bead room uh, so that I could sit at a, a bead table with a bunch of supplies on it with con storage containers behind me. That was all part of a setup of some living room in some house. So we've had this conversation about just because they call it a living room doesn't mean it has to be a living room. Just because they call it a bedroom doesn't mean it can't be a closet. Like <laughs> you have to think through what needs you have in the house and what spaces are there, irregardless of their current labels and it, see if there's a room that makes better sense for you to put where are all the kids going to study or who's going to have the office or what we have this room here. What are we going to use it for? Not what did the real estate agent tell us it was called and make that shift for yourself to claim the space and make it be functional for you better. Oh, we're getting late. Yes. Yeah. I think we probably have to, leave it there because we mm -hmm. uh, still have some we have right. a tittle to give you and we still have some announcements we have to make so yeah. let's uh talk about next week okay how can i help my decluttered friend my cluttered friend with her excess stuff what goes into a capsule wardrobe what's the best way to display digital photos next week we're going to answer these questions and other talk about other short topics suggested by our viewers and listeners so join us on september 24th at the usual time for ask us anything helping hands capsule wardrobes digital photos gail why don't you give us the tittle okay this week's tittle is called a small space usage plan this week's assignment is to evaluate a small space organizing challenge and start planning a solution Identify your toughest small space decluttering or organizing challenge. Typically, this is an area of your home with the highest ratio of contents to capacity, but it could be any space that's unreasonably small for your current needs, even a drawer. Pull everything out of the space in question, eliminating anything that you're ready to discard, donate, give away, relocate to a more appropriate spot. Consider removing existing shelves, racks, rods, partitions, etc that impede your ability to make the best use of the space in its current form. So think about how that room could be deconstructed or reconstructed to be more useful. Reflect on those ready-made or custom solutions that could replace any existing storage elements and decide what kind of budget you're willing to provide for the project. Take measurements to get a sense of how many containers of what size might help you manage the contents that go back into the space. And you can visit the websites, the websites of Container Store, Ikea, or any other outlet for organizing and storage solutions to get a sense of what's available that might address your small space challenge. And then make a plan for your revamped small space. Include some simple sketches, some measurements, and notes about containers and other solutions that plan to use. If you're ready to act on your solution, then you can schedule time to get to work 
If you're not ready yet, then you can put the contents back in the space to the best of your ability until you're ready to move forward. Hopefully what you're putting back is a lesser quantity than what you pulled out. You can at least do that step, even if you're not ready to uh, pay to have the, the area rebuilt in a more functional way. Uh, think about it, uh, do some processing, do some mental gymnastics there about how it would be better, and then come back and tell us how it went. We would love to hear about it. All right. If you're new to the, if, sorry, I'm in the wrong place. If you're watching this on YouTube, we'd love for you to join us live. To get notifications about upcoming events, we invite you to join the meetup group by visiting cfhou.com slash meetup. You can also follow us on Facebook by visiting cfhou.com slash Facebook or join our mailing list by visiting cfhou.com slash subscribe. We love to hear from you, so please keep your questions, comments, and topic suggestions coming on YouTube, Facebook, or anywhere that you find us. You can always reach us through the website at clutterfairhouston.com. We are so grateful that you're here every week. Thanks for coming and listening to us talk. You know we're going to be here next week talking about it again, so we will see you then. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.